Hello and welcome to the resources for this week, the second Sunday of Epiphany. Today we hear um, of calling, calling of Samuel, calling of Nathaniel and others in the, uh, in the Bible. Strange times in which we live, we are now locked down again and our churches are closed completely for worship and for private prayer, unfortunately. But um, as we all stay indoors and keep ourselves to ourselves, hopefully, eventually, with, uh, with lots of uh, goodwill and uh, lots of prayer and, of course, the rolling out of the vaccine, uh, we will get through all this. Anyway, today, second Sunday of Epiphany, I begin with a prayer. Eternal Lord, our beginning and our end, bring us with the whole creation to your glory, hidden through past ages and made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First reading is from the first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had began to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel! And he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lay down again. So Samuel did not... Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Gospel reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you come to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, Philip was the first person to whom Jesus extended his famous invitation, offering him the most basic form of salvation when he said, follow me. It was soon after Jesus met Philip that he made this simple, though life changing proposal. Come and join me. Share the rest of your journey with me. And Philip did just that. Such immediate acceptance of a life-altering offer seems out of character for Philip, because later passages in the Gospels show him to be a cautious and deliberate man who was typically slow to make decisions. This essential invitation to the Christian life is worth examining more closely. And the first thing to notice 
is that Jesus does not call us and then send us out into the world to rely only on our own resources. It is most reassuring to realise that the Christian life is not a solitary journey, because Jesus asks us to follow in companionship with him. The first thing that Philip did after encountering Jesus was to generously share his discovery with Nathaniel, his friend from the village of Cana. Philip's neighbour, Andrew, had the same impulse to share the good news of Jesus when he went directly to tell his brother, Simon Peter, we have found the Messiah. I imagine that Jesus sensed Philip's spirit of generosity that led him to share his good news with Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel's first reaction was sceptical when he said to Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip's response showed that he was wise in the ways of diplomacy. Instead of arguing with Philip, Philip had already learned from Jesus the best way to handle situations like this. So he said to Nathanael the very same thing that Jesus said to two disciples of John the Baptist, which was, come and see. He simply invited his friend to experience Jesus for himself. We cannot argue people into the kingdom of God. We love them into the kingdom of God. We cannot make people into converts through intellectual debate because that usually evokes resistance or defence. The way to draw people into the circle of Jesus' company is to love them as Jesus did. Such love becomes the magnet that draws people. Jesus said, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He would do this not by a display of intellectual brilliance, but by that unconditional love that was the essence of who he was and what he did. So Philip did not say, come and argue. Instead, he invited his friend to come and see for himself. We have a second glimpse of Philip later on in the gospel when Jesus and the disciples encountered a large group of people in the Galilean wilderness, an, ep an episode we know as the feed of, feeding of the 5,000. Jesus had compassion on them and began to teach them and heal their sick. As the sun was going down, the disciples came to him and said, send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. They didn't want to take responsibility for trying to feed that many people, nor risk the problems that might erupt in a restless and hungry crowd. They must have been very surprised when Jesus answered, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus asked Philip how they could buy bread to feed everyone and John's gospel comments, he said this to test him for he knew himself what he was going to do. Philip told Jesus that even if they spent all the money they had, they couldn't buy enough bread to feed even a little to each person there. Philip's reaction was entirely practical and human, but Jesus may have hoped he would have a sense of greater possibilities because Philip had witnessed Jesus heal many people. He'd witnessed him perform amazing miracles, and he'd been present when he turned water into wine at the wedding at Cana. With this in mind, we can make more sense of Jesus singling Philip out to test him, perhaps to raise his consciousness of how much more is possible with Christ than Philip's grasp of the facts had led him to assume. Philip was probably the kind of person who would call his limited sense of potential realistic, and Jesus was calling him to a higher faith in the power of divine energies. Philip had not learned yet that ultimately despair is presumptuous because it is saying something about reality and the future that we cannot know. Who can predict what is impossible for the one who can raise the dead to life? Nobody expected Easter. The last place we see Philip is in that great passage at the Last Supper when Jesus was preparing his disciples for what was about to come. He spoke the words you have probably heard at many funerals. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Here is that same incredible promise that we can count on him 
and he will not abandon us. But Thomas asked, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So Jesus went on to put it even more clearly. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. Yet in spite of all this, Jesus had taught them, and this unmistakable clarification, Philip asked for even more. Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus' response must have been filled with genuine frustration and sadness that he said, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. We may think of Philip as a slow learner to have been with Jesus for three years without understanding that he was in the presence of God, but the idea that the Messiah was both man and God was radically foreign, a radically foreign concept to first century Jews. And we owe Philip a debt of, debt of gratitude for his dogged inquisitiveness, because Jesus' response to him has blessed Christians for 20 centuries. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus was telling them that when they looked at him, they were looking at the essence of the Holy One. The unique distinction of the Christian religion is this wonderful gift of the Incarnation. The one who inhabited the heavens, assumed the form of a human being and came to us for our salvation. God became what we are so that we can understand what God is. The answer that Jesus gave to Philip, the one who has seen me has seen the Father, puts the unique central claim of the Christian religion in its very clearest most powerful form, which is incarnation, the coming of God in flesh and blood. It is the most incredible act of mercy and the most redeeming and enlightening of all events. The Eternal chose to enter time and space to become what we are, and this sets Christianity apart. To the question that humans have asked from time immemorial, what is God like? The Gospel answered, God is like Jesus. So following the lives of Philip and all those others, we are called to be disciples. But what does that really mean? Well, to be a disciple is to follow Jesus. Discipleship begins with a call, come to me, follow me. And to be a Christian is to walk behind Jesus. He leads, whether to the other side of the lake, to Jerusalem or to Galilee, and the call to discipleship is to follow in his steps, even if this means, means taking up our own cross behind him. Following Jesus involves breaking with the past. The Galilean fishermen left nets and family. Levi had to walk away from the tax office. The rich young ruler was unwilling to make this break, and Jesus referred to this as hating your life and forsaking all for his sake. Many in the crowds found the cost too much, too high. And the word disciple literally means a learner. And this highlights a third aspect of the Christian life. Disciples have not left school. Jesus invited men and women to take on his yoke and learn from him. In this, he was just like the rabbis who taught their students a whole life package. The twelve are chosen to be with him. By watching, listening and living with Jesus, the disciples learned the secret of the kingdom at a level much deeper than words. They saw Jesus praying, arguing, healing, teaching. Some saw him transfigured or in agony. To be a disciple is to learn from Jesus by sharing every part of his life. Our calling reminds us that life itself is impregnated with the presence of God, with his unceasing love and grace. It also reminds us that God awaits our response to his invitation to spend eternity with him. In a word, it tells us life is a journey which will end before his throne, and then it will be made clear whether we have accepted or rejected the call of God. Every day we can re-examine our lives afresh in the light of the gospel, in the knowledge that we can change our ways, our attitudes, change our prejudices, this can be seen in all areas of life, both within the church and outside. We need to be faithful wherever we go. 
It means that as congregations, we continually need to find ways to reach out to the wider community, to show others that what we have in this place is worth having, to demonstrate that we are a loving community, to show others that ours is a living faith, growing and developing all the time. If we close our minds, if we refuse to grow closer to God, then we will lack vision and become stale and unloving. We may not know an awful lot about the first disciples as people, but so much of what they went were about and how Jesus responded to them shows the very nature of God. It is this nature and how we reflect it, reflect it that is important, especially when thinking about how we have been drawn to God. The only stumbling block is our response. We need to approach with arms continually outstretched in order to respond to the embrace of our Creator. It seems to me that this is the only way, knowing that we have not yet got life cracked, but being continually drawn towards the source of all life and goodness. How we deal with such a challenge is ultimately a matter between us and God. Amen. So let us pray. Lord, as you called the disciples, open our ears to your calling. Open our eyes to your presence. Open our hearts to your love. That we may hear you and hearing you may love you and loving you may serve you. Whom to serve is perfect freedom. We give you thanks, O Lord, for you have called us to know you and to proclaim you. Make us worthy of our calling. May we be faithful to you in our discipleship. We pray that each in their calling may seek to do your will. That your church may be attentive to your word and seek to do your will. That we may share in the mission and saving work of Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are seeking to live up to their calling, for all who are striving to keep the ideals that they see. We remember all whose work has been frustrated by evil or by accident. We pray for those who are underprivileged, for those who are unemployed, for those who are work weary, and particularly for those who are exploited. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, make us aware that you are ever calling us to new ventures, to new visions. You call us to extend ourselves, even in these difficult times. We pray for the communities to which we belong and in which we have an active share. May we see our daily work as part of our discipleship and part of our discipline. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who feel that they have laboured in vain, for all who have toiled hard and achieved nothing, for those whose world has collapsed around them. We remember all who have been recently made homeless, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost possessions. We pray for all who, through illness, are unable to fulfil themselves, for all who are frustrated with life, all who feel like giving up. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we give thanks for all who have been faithful disciples, who have heeded your call and obeyed your commands. We pray for those who now serve you with the saints in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, who called you to work with him, Strengthen you by the power of his spirit, that you may be worthy of his calling. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining me again, and uh, hope you keep uh, keep safe, keep well, keep warm in this difficult and cold weather. And I hope that we will be able to meet very soon in person um, once things have uh, eased and the situation nationally and across the world uh, gets better with this virus. But keep safe and please be sensible when meeting others. And uh, if we can all simply do as we're asked to do, I'm sure that things will improve. Um, very, very soon. So thank you and God bless.